Bruchem Aboim. Thank you for coming. The lecture uh, tonight will deal with a uh, a topic that is something we all deal with in one form or another. And we, I think, basically we all have a, a negative outlook on and approach. That's death. And even though I know people see it as a negative, but the real question is, is it good or bad? And it's kind of a silly question. No one really wants to die. And in fact, if anything, we fight to stay alive. So crazy as it sounds, it's all part of life. Um, there's a Pirkei boat in the Ethics of the Father. Rabbi Yaakov says that this world is like a lobby before the world to come. Prepare yourself in the lobby so you may enter into the banquet hall. So, this world, I think the best way to compare, to understand how, what, what this world's about, is I think the baby in the womb gives us a real direction on what life's about. And whether death is really death or not. That baby's in the womb for generally nine months. And the truth of the matter is, Barbara Walters does one of her specials and goes in and interviews the baby and says, would you like to be born? The baby's going to say, why? I am totally content here. I have everything I need. And then when she tries to explain to the baby, but you don't get it, there's a world out there with people. And she, he says, what's people? I've never, what's people? And, and, and there's birds and, and there's flowers and there's trees. He doesn't know what she's talking about. You'll be breathing air. Babies in water. Everything that's open in the womb is closed. When the baby comes out, the baby, the umbilical cord becomes the key to everything. And when you come out, it's an innie or an outie. It doesn't make a difference. Baby's not eating. Baby's not seeing. If she, if she tries to tell the baby about color, What's color? None of these things happen. So, and we don't hear about, you know, on the news, baby escapes the womb. A, a mother would love to see that happen. Women have to push strong and hard to get that baby out. That baby does not want to leave. And it's silly. Why would a baby want to stay in the womb? Look what this world is. And yet the baby wants to stay. And we have that same grasp on this world. We see this world as the main body, not as the lobby, as this Mishnah, as this proportion in Pirkei Avot, in the essence of the Father I just quoted says. We see it as the banquet hall. We're totally content in the lobby. And someone says, come on into the banquet hall. And we say, why? I, I have everything I need here. And we say, but you, don't, you have no idea what's waiting for you. But the truth is, just like the baby, what's waiting for us is beyond our imagination. Beyond what we can understand. And even in Judaism, the only description of the world to come is Sadikim Yoshim V'yatrosem B'roshehem Nehenem Zivoshechina That righteous people sit with their crowns on their head and they bask in the ray of godliness. If you know what that is, please tell me because I have no idea what I just said. That's it. And somehow, some way, just like that baby, that is the magnificence of everything. To be that close to God, to be able to see that revelation, to somehow, you know, we're only able to use about 20% of our brain, and that's if you're really using your brain. 20% is really over, over time. What's the other 80 for? And the answer is that we could understand God on a much higher plane if we weren't limited by a body. In fact, we believe that the soul resides in the brain. So that becomes the key. That we have somehow a greater sense of God when we, even though we call it death, it's really life. It's graduation. Now, how do we, how do we know that this is in existence? There's one common denominator in what we call a near-death experience from different people, different ages, different backgrounds, different countries, different ethnic groups. 
But one common thread, two things are always said, you hear again and again and again. People with near-death experiences talk about a tunnel and a bright light. A tunnel and a bright light. What does a baby see when it's born? A tunnel and a bright light. So this passage from the womb into this world is a stage in the final passage from this world into eternity. And that's really what it's all about. We fear death. Why? And the answer is fear the unknown. And, you know, there's a saying that says if death is so good, why, doesn't, why don't they come back and tell us? And I always say they're having such a good time, they forget all about us, and that's why they don't come back. But in reality, how do we have a proof? How do we know? A, that there's a next world. And B, that it's good. And the truth of the matter is, the Torah itself gives us a story that proves the fact to be true. <clears throat> we see, when you talk about kindness, there's only one name that comes to mind. The Torah tells us that Abraham, Abram Avinu, was the kindest of all men. To a fault. He loved everyone. Even his, even his son, Yishmael, who God had to force him to send out of his house. He was the kindest of all people. That's why he was such a magnet to bring people closer to God. His trait was called chesed, kindness. And yet, God says to Avram Avinu, Abraham, who did not have his special son Yitzchak Isaac until the age of 100, and with bated breath waited, prayed, for this son to be born. And when this son, this diamond was born to him, his life became full. And this was the, the heir to the throne. Yitzhak was the one who God was going to give all the blessings to to carry on this legacy that Abraham Ravino, that Abraham began. And at the age of 37, Abraham is 137. I, Isaac Yitzhak is 37 years old. God says to Avram Binu, Kachna as bincha as yechidcha shahafta. Take, and he says, please, not even a command. Please take the son that you love, your only son, Yitzchak, and bring him up as a sacrifice. Abraham is supposed to say to God, because in the same portion, a few chapters back, a chapter back, what does it talk about? God tells Abraham, I'm going to destroy the evil cities of Sodom and Amorah. Where it was a capital crime to show hospitality. In complete contrast to Abraham who opened his house to everyone free of charge. He had four doors on each direction taking in guests, not charging him anything. Just, they just had to bless God. Spreading monotheism in the world. These evil people, in fact, it says what sealed their fate was when a young girl was supporting uh, some kind of beggar. And they didn't know how, and they found out that she was feeding him. That they stripped her naked, hung her from the wall of the city, covered her body with honey, and the bees killed her by stinging her to death. That's how evil they were. And yet... When God tells Abraham that he's going to destroy these five cities... Abraham stands toe-to-toe -to, -toe to God and argues with God to save these cities for 50 righteous people, for 40 righteous people, for 30 righteous people, for 20 righteous people, for 10 righteous people. Toe-to-toe -to -toe with God arguing for the lives of evil people that, that were totally against everything he believed. And then God says, bring your son as a sacrifice, which is what Abraham his whole life fought against human sacrifices that idol worshippers had. Uh, there was a, uh, an idol worship called Molech where people would bring their firstborn or children and put them through fire. He said it was wrong. You shouldn't do it. And now, in contrast to everything that he said before and preached to people of serving one God, one benevolent God, he was going to take his son, Yitzchak, who he loved and who he thought was a complete tzaddik, a righteous individual, Abraham gets up early in the morning can't wait to do this to sacrifice his son 
And for three days, he travels with his son to find the place where he's supposed to do it. He doesn't know where. God makes him think about it for three days. And with his resolve, he still decides he's going to do this. And he climbs up on the mountain. And he is going to, he ties up his son. It's called the Akeda for the binding of Yitzchak. And he picks up the knife. And an angel tells him, calls out his name, Avram, Avram, twice. Why? <laughs> because he wants to do this. With tears of joy, he's going to kill his son. But why? What did his son do? And the answer is that he understood that God wanted his son because his son was an overachiever. In fact, what he was saying, an angel can't talk to someone when they're in a state of sorrow. When Joseph, when Yosef was sold to Egypt, God did not communicate with Yaakov, Jacob, for 22 years. Because he mourned the loss of his son. And yet Abraham is on the mountain with a knife in his hand to kill his own son. Because he understood that his son was going, was, was graduation day. And Abraham's thought is, why don't you take me too? Why am I here? Why can't I graduate? It's the same as if, imagine you take an exam, eight-hour exam. And after four hours, one guy gets up, struts up to the instructor, puts his paper down, turns to the class, smiles, and walks out. You feel sorry for him? No, you feel sorry for yourself. You still have to get through. you got four hours to go, and it's not going to be enough time. You're not sure what you're going to do. He just aced the exam. So what we run from, what we dread is really the final reward. This continuation of life that, can, that began it in the womb, that goes into the, this lobby, that finishes off with eternity. And as much as we run from it, Psalm 23, which talks about Lo ira ra ki I have no fear because you're with me, referring to God. And it says at the end of, of Psalm 23, that only goodness and kindness should pursue me all the days of my life. What is the goodness and the kindness that pursues a person? That I should stay with God, live with God, dwell with God till the end of time. That's death. That goodness and that kindness is the final reward that we all strive for. That's what life's about. This is a world of action. Why are we in this world? Because God can give us the gift of heaven, the gift of this next part of life, eternity. But what he says to us, instead of me giving it to you, I'm going to give you an opportunity to earn it. When you inherit money, you spend it. When you earn money, you save it. People plant tomatoes. Why? <laughs> Have you ever walked into a supermarket where there aren't tomatoes? So people go and they plant tomatoes and they spend a fortune on these tomatoes and they have to give them to their friends so they have more tomatoes than they can eat. And they tell you, take a bite. It's so wonderful. You take a bite. It's a tomato. Not to him. It's wonderful. Why? He planted it with his own hands. He has the joy of doing that. And what God says is, I'm going to give you the joy and the ability to move on to the next world. And to find your place by earning it. And this becomes the key. So death is really not the end of the game. Death is really the final chapter of what it's about. It's graduation day. Imagine a, a young man who's in college and just keeps getting degrees and just stays there and never graduates. Graduation day is the best thing. Granted, there's fear of leaving where he is and the friends that he has. And the trepidation of what's coming on. But if he's done well in college. But he's got a good job in life. And all he's done will, will have come from that. And next, next time we get together. We'll continue on this theme. About what life's all about. The true life that we call death. Thank you for coming. God bless and have a good Shabbos.